We are working through the Psalms, working through what it means to pray and remember God and worship God. And now we find ourselves in a very familiar time of the year because it comes every year. Today is New Year's Eve. Today is the day where we're going to find out who among you are um, driven people. So anyone made resolutions for 2018? Raise your hand if you have. Okay, so all three of you, anyone here not make a resolution for 2018? Look at all of you guys. Now, just so you know, so that we're clear logically, not making a resolution is a resolution, and you are all slaying it, okay? Like, this is what you guys are doing a great job at making some form of a resolution. And one of the things we're going to look at today is, is going forward, how can we remember God? What do we need to resolve to know about God, remember about God, so that we have a positive trajectory in the future, so that we can become more thankful, more loving, more addicted and in love with Jesus and our community than we were before? And in Psalm 106, it gives us a blueprint of what the people in the Old Testament did wrong over and over again, so that hopefully we don't fall into their same trap. So we're going to pray, jump into Psalm 106, and see what the Lord will speak to us today. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I ask that, that today, as we open this psalm, as we prepare our hearts and minds to hear your word, that you would, that you would give us memories to recollect all of the amazing things that you have done for us in 2017. And, and God, for some people, 2017 has been rough. I pray that you would give us sight to see your faithfulness, even in the midst of difficult times. Lord, I pray that when we leave this service, we will have more gratitude and less complaining in our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would change us and shape us into your image. God, I pray for those who are here with questions ahead of time, that you would answer questions and speak to the hearts and minds of all of us. In Jesus' name we pray, all God's kids said, amen. The title of this sermon is God's Ginkgo Biloba. Um, and that's a really small window. So if you get that joke, then you probably know like the Grey Poupon commercials. I think it's the same era. Uh, memory is a very important thing. Some of you may have amazing memories like me. I have a memory like an elephant. I can remember anything that I read, look at, listen to. I can remember so much except for where I put anything practical that I need on any given day. You could say, oh, Pastor Ryan, what did you read your freshman year of Bible college? I can start rattling off papers. You could say, Pastor Ryan, where are your keys? And I will look as dumbfounded as a schoolboy on the first day of school. You can ask my wife. I lose my wallet and keys regularly. And by regularly, I mean multiple times per day. There are times where, um, and the internet must know, the internet is so creepy nowadays, it knows everything about us. Um, like it, it hears you in your phone, so then it markets to you like on Facebook and Google AdWords. My internet God has learned that I lose things. I think it hears my wife telling me where things are all the time. So I get these ads that say, buy this device. It's whatever, tracker something. And if you buy it, you can put one on your keys and put one on your wallet and put one on your phone. And that way, when you lose something, you just have to have your keys or your wallet or your phone, and you can find the other two. I don't know how it works. I think it's like uh, pixie dust or devil stuff. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and so my question is, though, I'm not going to buy this thing because you get one chip for your keys, one for your phone, one for your wallet. That's not my problem, not losing one of them. My problem is losing all three of them simultaneously nearly every day. There is always a frantic time of the week where I'm saying, babe, have you seen my wallet? I've looked everywhere for it. And she'll say something that would make sense in a normal human, like, have you checked in your pants? <laughs> of course I've checked in my pants. So then you got to take it out, put it on the dresser, lie and say, it was on the dresser. How did I miss that? No, you don't do that. That's bad. But when we don't remember things, it changes. Some of us know this with arguments. If you've ever been in an argument where you have one, like you're sure this is how it happened and your friend or spouse or whoever says, no, no, this is how it happened. One of you is right, and it's probably not you. So we need to ask God today to sharpen our memories because it's going to produce something in us. So Psalm 106 verse 1 says this, and it's not on the screen because this projector was going out all Christmas Eve, and I thought, it's just going to break. I'm not going to worry about it. We're getting a new one on Tuesday, and of course, it's been working like a beast perfectly all day. But um, Psalm 106 verse 1. Praise the Lord, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. 
Who can utter the mighty deeds of the Lord or declare all his praise? Blessed are they who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. So this psalm starts out with just a blanket statement. Give thanks. Now this, I think, is, is what our attitude should be. If you listen to any motivational speaker, they'll jump up and down and say, we got to have an attitude of gratitude. And I didn't want to try to be Tony Robbins today because we're like the same height, but his hands are seven times bigger um, and his head's just enormous. Anyway, we do need to be a grateful people. And oftentimes, church people are known for low bar gratitude levels. Now, if you are an ungrateful person by nature, just know that you're difficult to be around. And I want you to also know this. Unrelated to Christianity in the Bible, if you have a life with more gratitude, you can Google this. Uh, effects of gratitude on longevity of life or effects of gratitude on uh, physiology. Grateful people are healthier and live longer. Now, if that's not a reason at New Year's Eve time, because I know even though you didn't raise your hands, like 30% of you have a secret thing, like I'm going to eat more grapes and less beef jerky this year. If you want to be healthier, freebie, be more grateful this year. And it's hard. I, and I'm not just going to say be more grateful and go work at it because I know how that works. As a pastor, I can say a lot of things and say, hey, do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that, or you're bad people or good people, and I can put you in categories. Or I can say here is why we can be grateful, because of all that God has given us and done for us. The, the psalm says, give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. So giving thanks has a reason to give thanks. And in our culture, it is much, much easier to not have a, an attitude of gratitude, but rather to have a heart that's full of cantankerous complaining. I couldn't think of a good k word that went with complaining. So cantankerous is just for the British people in the audience, okay? Or the Jamaicans, because never mind. That's a history lesson. So um, if, you, if you need an experiment with this uh, and you want to change your heart, what you focus on most is what will shape your gratitude or your complaining. If you focus on things that are going to highlight the negative, then you will constantly produce the negative. It, think of it this way. What you pour in is what comes out. So you can pour in, hypothetical, you can wake up in the morning, ah, and you could turn on the news. Pick whichever news station you want. Fox, CNN, MSNBC. I know half of you are like fake news. The other half are like fake news, fake news. I don't care. It's all negative news. You're, it's rare that you turn on the news and they're like, today a puppy was rescued. And then young men were helping blind people across the streets everywhere. And then people gave half their bank accounts to the poor. It was an amazing day in Tampa Bay. Signing off, Rich Richardson. I, you never see that. It's like somebody was killed, there was an accident. And, and we had this question at Band of Brothers on Wednesday, and I asked, I wonder if they make negative news, and that creates us as negative people, or if, if it's that we are drawn to it so much that they make it because they know we're going to eat it up. And I, I think it's probably a twofer. You know, first we make our habits, and then the habits that you choose to make are the habits that then make you. It's a cyclical thing. But if you keep putting negative stuff in, negative stuff will come out. And in the Bible, there is a theme from beginning to end about giving thanks to God and the importance of it. There's a theme about giving thanks and seeing what God has done so that you can live and act rightly before him. We all just went through Christmas. It's an amazing time of giving thanks. It's an amazing time of seeing how children and adults react when they get Christmas gifts. I got a Christmas gift this year. I got to be honest, I was so excited for it. As many of you know, I'm a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. I've got my socks on today because today is the last game of the season where we destroy the Browns with all of our backup players. And um, too soon, too soon. And, um, and my wife got me a, a, a jersey. Now, even if you don't follow sports, you'll feel the pain with this. So she got me a jersey from one of my all-time favorite Steelers players. His name is James Harrison. Amazing guy. So he gets cut two days before Christmas. So long after the present has been purchased, it's wrapped, he was cut from the Steelers. And then, like the day after Christmas, he signed with the New England Patriots. For those of you who don't know, it's like Luke Skywalker when he was receiving Darth Vader's offer, saying, yes, Dad, I'll go with you. I mean, that's the betrayal that I felt when this happened. My friends are just 
hitting me up, text, Facebook, tweet, everything. What are you going to do with that jersey? Because I posted it on Christmas. I took pointers of it. I like, look at me. Yes. And then the next day, all of my Steelers friends were like, dude, what are you going to do with that thing? Do you have fireplaces in Florida? I was like, I don't know. We have snow next week. It's a miracle. Uh, I'm returning it, obviously. I can't do that. No one buys a sweater with Luke Skywalker and a Vader helmet. And I was so grateful for that gift. The, sen the scenario changed. Gratitude went upside down. I'm not going to confirm or deny, but I might have just teared up a couple of times or days. <clears throat> I'm still hurting. I don't, I don't like Patriots fans in the second service. They're everywhere. My gratitude got flipped upside down. I forgot what matters most. And what matters most, if we're being honest, is that my happiness or joy is not determined by a group of 20 to 30-year-old sweaty men watching a football fly around a field. But so often that's the case. In case you don't know what that meant, that meant if your happiness is determined by whether your team wins or loses, you have an idol issue. There's something that you've put up as ultimate in your life. And, and don't think that it's you do this and I don't. I can't lie in this service because my wife is here. Um, but if you forget what God has done for you, you, you won't have gladness in your heart. If all you see God as is a Band-Aid, then all he'll be is this miniature healer. But if you recognize that you were dead and God gives you life over and over again, then your gratitude will change and grow the longer you walk with the Lord. So because this psalm is so big, we're going to jump down to verse 6. Both we and our fathers have sinned. Everyone say, uh-oh. We have committed iniquity, church word for deep grave sin. We have done wickedness. Now, the question is, what is the wickedness the fathers have done? Here it is. Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wondrous works. They did not remember, ginkgo biloba, the abundance of your steadfast love. Sin enters our lives when we forget what God has done. It's as simple as that. It's the simplest math equation you can put into a soul. When you forget what God has done, you will eventually walk away from God. The Old Testament people did it time and time again. God rescued them from Egypt. They freaked out at the shore of the Red Sea. God parted the Red Sea. They get across the Red Sea. They don't hear from God for 40 days, so they build a gold calf to worship instead of the living God. They repent and believe and people die because God got mad. They go out into the desert and they're wandering the desert because they didn't believe in the God that had parted the Red Sea, sent the 10 plagues. They didn't believe and follow God after he literally sent the Jewish equivalent of Krispy Kreme donuts onto the ground in the middle of the desert. That's called manna for you Bible kids, okay? That sweet honey bread just falls down. They ate it, just miraculous. Now, I don't know about you, but if God does a fraction of these things in my life, I'm all about the believing. Like if I were praying one morning and I said, Lord, I'm, I'm hungry. We don't have food. And if I just walked outside and there were Krispy Kremes, not in boxes, like someone sneak delivered them because I don't trust most people and I would think I'm getting poisoned. But if they were just covering everywhere, like my patio, my lawn, just Krispy Kreme donuts warm, steaming in the Florida mist, and God just said from heaven, you're welcome. <laughs> I would be enthralled with God for such a long time. I think I would remember this as the great donut apocalypse of 2017. My kids would love it. We would remember it. And you think, well, did the Israelites really like just, they did keep forgetting? Well, we would never do that because we are modern, sensible people. We remember everything. Most of you don't even know your children's phone numbers. But most of you don't know your sister's phone number. Most of you have maybe three phone numbers memorized, and if you have more than that, it's because you were born before 1970. Because now, I'm serious. The internet changed our brains. It's legit. It's called neuroplasticity. Our phones have rewired the way we think and remember. There's a reason why when I say to people, hey, let's do some scripture memory together, they say, well, I don't, I don't memorize, I can't memorize anything. Why, why is that? Because our brains are changing. We depend on this so much. We depend on a, a, a little 
digital crutch to carry us along, and we can use this for good or for bad. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. I just bought my phone, uh, a phone for my son. Uh, I think it's a wonderful invention because I can set up a digital fence, and if he goes outside that fence, it beeps. I'm just worried that now I'm going to have a digital fence and my wife will know when I leave. Um, but I, it can be for good or for bad. It can help us draw toward God or away from God, but one thing it's doing for sure is that it's, it's forcing us to decide what we want to remember and what we don't, because we have all of the information in the world at our fingertips. We have more information being created every single day than in the previous 500,000 years combined prior. Every person with a keyboard or a microphone is blogging, vlogging, togging, snapping, tweeting, whatever. It's just flooding it. Congress literally said this year in 2018, we're putting a cap on the number of tweets for the Library of Congress because it's just too much information. When we have this bombardment of information, we think, well, we wouldn't forget what God has done. Some of us have forgotten what God has done this year. Some of us haven't taken the time to look back because in our world that's so driven to go forward, 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 and in our world that's so full of noise, 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 many of us rarely find time to be still and know that he is God to slow down our hearts. If you're anything like me, noise starts when the alarm goes off and noise ends when your eyes and unconsciousness sweep over you. There's constant noise in our culture. And until we can learn to step out of that and look at what God has done and be thankful for it, our gratitude will not tend to grow. So there's this thing that I love that um, was done around here, and it was sort of like a weird group of people that did it. And by weird group, it, some of you might be these people. But there, were, there was this season this year, 2017, where people were painting rocks, and they were leaving them all over. They'd paint a happy face on them. They'd paint like a breast cancer awareness or a Bible verse or something encouraging, and they would just litter the rocks all over this community. And I loved it. Because in the Bible, there's this thing called the Stones of Remembrance, where every time God did something, they would set up a pile of rocks so that when you walk by it again later, you could say, that's to remind us of what God did in our lives on this such and such a date. So I would take uh, my own rocks, and I wasn't part of any of their clubs. Like, they had clubs, and they would say, I hid some here, go find them. I was just a random rock graffiti artist because I wanted to make cool sayings, make people laugh, hide things. And of course, I'm a pastor, so I had to write Bible verses on some of them, but I really just wanted to be like an ornery kid. It was my way of getting my teenage angst out, and I was just hiding rocks all over jokes, funny pictures. And, and then I thought, man, why don't we do this thing that the, the Israelites did, set up stones of remembrance. And I've done it before with different things. There's places where I can go in my mind where when God carried me through this trial, I went here. So for me, one of the reasons why I talk about um, living in Hawaii so much is because for me, living on Hawaii on the big island, which is the best island of them all, was it's one of my stones of remembrance. I, I had bought a one-way ticket. I had moved to the island of Hawaii because I needed God to be my dad. And I landed on that beach, and I just cried. So whenever anyone says Hawaii, if you say Hawaii near me, I have an involuntary, ah, oh, because it's a stone of remembrance. And it's a good stone of remembrance to have because it's mandatory that you visit your stones of remembrance every year in Jewish traditions. That's not true, but I really want to go to Hawaii. I'm going to make a stone of remembrance on the Bahamas this year. Those are my resolutions. But where are you setting up things to remind you of what God has done? Some of us are good at this. Some of us not so good because the pace of life is so fast. But if I'm going to encourage you to do anything, it's to not do what the Israelites did. They sinned by forgetting, by not remembering the steadfast love of God. They rebelled by the sea. They rebelled on the mountain. They rebelled in the desert. And God, time and time again, saved them and rescued them. Then they rebelled. Saved them, rescued them. Then they rebelled. Where in your life, and I need you to do this in your own head, do you have God moments, God markers? So it usually starts sometime around when you got saved. You, you were born, but that's not a huge accomplishment. That's why I don't care for birthdays, because you didn't have anything to do with your birth. That's Barry Manilow and your parents, okay? Um, you, you get born again, and it's God all over you. He's, he's changing, shaping, putting people in your path. That's your first marker, your God marker. You should have a moment that celebrates this was the marker. In, in Christianity, we actually call this the baptism. It's an outward ex expression of an inward reality. So if you've never been baptized, but you believe in Jesus, we need to baptize you like today. And luck would have it, we're in the middle of Florida's greatest winter in 41 years, which means there's a ton of manatees in the ocean. 
So if you want to get baptized with manatees, I am super down. Just call me, text me, email me. We're going to make this happen. But the reason you do this is because it's your first remembrance. I remember my baptism. I could recall the moment. I could recall the feel of the water. I know what I was wearing. I know which board shorts I had on. I remember what was said. I remember getting dunked. It's a stone of remembrance. It's a time to mark something. And then you work through life. And maybe you go through seasons of relative ease, and then life hits hard. And some of you have those years. You know, for me, like I've got a like 2005, it's a hard year. And I remember what God brought me through. Now, when you're in the middle of a hard year, it's never pleasant. But looking back, you can always see that that's where you grew the most. Because when you're in the midst of difficult times, it's when you let go of things that you thought were important and you grab onto God because your soul and heart knows that he is most important. And it's in those years you look back and say, look at what God carried me through. I made it through this. I made it through that because God loved me and forgave me and pressed into me. And I, and I want you to do this, even if you're not a resolution person. And I, I know that as time has gone on, it's a, it's a weird sociological phenomenon. Less and less people are making resolutions. I have next to my desk a, um, a poster of Jonathan Edwards. He's an old dead guy. And it's just all of his resolutions he did for daily life, like 92 of them are on my poster, where it just says, resolved to do this with my time, resolved to do this with my Bible reading, resolved, and it's resolved, and it's right here. So if I'm typing or I'm praying, I look over and I just have massive resolutions. I want them all around me. And I want them around me not just to make me a driven person. We have some driven people here at the chapel. I, my joke when people say, you know, what is your, what is your church family like? You know, I say, well, it's, we're a ragtag bunch of people around Christmas time. I refer to us as the island of misfit church. Um, and, and then I also would say, I just love our mix because we've got different ethnicities, different theological backgrounds. But one thing that's pretty consistent, we only have like 5% type A personalities here, like those hyper drivers. And then we've got 95% like type B through F personalities, like the people who are like, oh, it's all good, man. I'm just going to go to the beach today and every day. And I don't, I mean, I don't always get that. I, mean, I have people, one of them's here, one of my friends, she always says, could you just do Facebook live services so we can do church at the beach? And I'm like, man, no, because I'm jealous, not because I don't want to. And I get that though. But this idea that for me, wanting to be resolved, because I'm not naturally like a type A. I, I've worked into this with God's grace, and I don't think it's the best way for everyone to be. It's a little neurotic. It's just too much caffeine and not enough bacon. And, um, and what happens is, the more I, for me, the more I look at how much God loves me, and the more I reflect at what he's done for me through the years, the more it makes me want to live forward. The more it makes me want to love others and pour out. Because I've seen at times in my life where I've tried to make it all about me, and life doesn't go well. Life always goes well when you live your life in the way that God hardwired the universe. Love God and love others. And then pieces begin to fall into place. Now here's what's interesting. In this psalm, because we're not going to have time to read it all, we would be here until um, like the first service next week. Uh, they go over and over again because they remember and uh, they, they forget. God saves them. And they're like, oh yes, God, you are there. And then they forget again. Like verse 13, they soon forgot his works and they did not wait for his counsel. And then people died. And then they go to the mountain, and then it says they made, verse 19, they made a calf in Horeb, that's the golden calf, and they worshiped the metal of image. They exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. This is the same word and verbiage that they're using in Romans chapter 1 in the New Testament. Paul says, we all have exchanged the truth about God. God is this way, made the world this way, is this way. We've exchanged that truth for a lie about God. We've stopped worshiping the living God, and we've started worshiping things that are not as powerful, not as important. And you might say, I would never worship an image of an ox that eats grass. But some of us in this room worship cotton paper with ink on it. Some of us in this room worship kids and their achievements. Some of us in this room worship football teams and their success. We do. And you would, you would say, oh, I never worship them. I don't worship money. Where do you put your hope and identity and worth and value in? If you make money, do you feel more valuable to your family? Do you feel more accepted? Do you feel more, feel more approved of? Because that's the definition of a god, lowercase g, or an idol, as we call them here at the chapel. An idol is anything that you give your heart and life to, to find your security, worth, value, identity, acceptance, or approval. 
We should find those things and draw those things from the God and Savior of the Bible, not from the created things of this world, not from money or security or things or relationships, but from God himself. Now, here's one of the things that I love about this. In verse 23, so after they've, they've forgotten, God is saved. They've forgotten, God is saved. They've forgotten, God is saved. One time, it's talking about how when God was so mad, he was going to reboot his people. And by reboot, I mean destroy them. Verse 23 says, Therefore he said he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to turn away his wrath from destroying them. Now, whenever God is talking to people, he's not um, talking for his own sake. He's talking for our sake. When God said, you know, where are you, Adam, in the Garden of Eden? God wasn't like covering his eyes. God knew where Adam was. It was to draw something out of Adam. God wanted to draw something out of Moses. So when God said, I am angry with my people, I'm going to destroy them, he was drawing out of Moses Moses' moment to stand in the breach, to stand in the gap between God and his people, to say, God, please don't. I'm Moses. I'm your faithful servant. Please relent and do not be angry. Now, this is important for you and I, because in this year, some of you will do resolutions despite claiming you won't. Some of you today are going to be so inspired. You're going to go home and say, I'm going to journal resolutions. Those are the type AB people. The rest of you are going to be like, I'm so inspired, I'm going to think about a resolution. Those are the people who are going to fail by January 4th. Um, But it's okay. Because of what this points to. This phrase that Moses stood in the breach, Moses stood in the gap between God and Israel, between holiness and perfection and sinfulness and forgetfulness. Moses stood and said, God, please let me stand in this gap. Now, Moses can't do that for you and I because he's not here. He's dead and in paradise. I cannot stand in the gap for you. I pray for you often. I pray for some of you really often um, because I know you need it or I believe that you need it. (laughs) You choose which one I pray for you. But I can't stand in the gap. There is one who can. Jesus, the Son of God, stands in the gap for you and I. What Moses was in the Old Testament was a picture pointing to someone who would stand in the gap for all of eternity, not just for one situation. What, what Jesus is, is the true and better Moses, who doesn't just stand in the gap between God and his anger over one situation, but Jesus stands in the gap between God and his wrath against sin for all situations. People often ask, and, and I think there's a big mistake in Christianity, they say, what are you saved from? You Christians talk about being saved. You're saved, you're saved, you're saved. What are you saved from? A lot of people say you're saved from hell. And, and while destinationally that, that is true, Um, That is not the thing that sends us there. What we are saved from is the wrath of God. The Bible is very clear that Jesus came, died on a cross, and he absorbed the wrath of God against sin on our behalf so that now the wrath of God is not on you, toward you, or around you whatsoever. Your flat tire, your, your pay decrease, where every bad thing that's happened, it's not because God looks at you, saw your disobedience, and said, I'm gonna smite their finances. If you are in Jesus Christ, if your faith is in him, then all you have on you is the favor of God that Jesus earned and deserves. That's it. It is just mercy, 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 because Jesus stood in the eternal gap for you on your behalf. There is no person who will be struck by lightning coming into this church, despite people saying that to me on a regular basis. When I go to bars and coffee shops and invite people here, they say, I can't go to church. God will strike me down with lightning. And I tell them all the time, I sit and preach every week in front of a bunch of people who probably should have been struck down, but God was gracious toward them. You may be feeling like you are too far from God. I need you to know that Jesus stood in the gap before you. Though you forget a thousand times, God never forgets. Though every man a liar, God will always be true because he made the promise to pursue you, to save you, to love you. He sent his son to die for the sins of the world, to bring you into his forever family. He is your covering when everything in your life is falling apart. Remember those moments, the dark moments of your life, and give thanks that God covered you then as he covers you now and as he will cover you in 2018. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that those in here who feel far from you would be drawn close by your love and forgiveness. I pray that they would see the gravity of their sin, but that that would spur them onto gratitude for how much you must love them to die for them. 
Lord, I pray for all of us that this year would be a year filled with purpose, filled with radical sacrificial love for others, filled with an addiction to knowing you more and more. God, draw us into your word in any way that stirs our affections for Jesus. Make our lives this year all about him. In Jesus' name, amen.